Gosh, I should be wearing red. Stupid. Um, it's probably one of the uh, most personal stories I've written for a long time. Um, and I wrote it, I began to write it just after my son had left for his gap year for his travels to South America. And I was anxious. And, you know, he, it was the it, hopefully it'll be the furthest and the longest perhaps he'll ever be away from me <laughs> um, and I didn't allow myself to finish the story until he'd come back until I knew he was safe because um, any parent who's had a son actually I think a son even more than a daughter going on a gap year knows that there'll be moments when you're completely out of touch um, when there's a sort of anxiety that you may never see this precious human being ever again and I did many times go through that so it, it's, it's deeply personal that feeling of separation that I felt while William was away um, and then once I'd met him at the airport on his return I finished the story because I, I couldn't do that until I knew he was safely back um, so the story is really about the feeling I mean I'm not a single mother but I made the protagonist a single mother and it's about what she, little bit to do with what she goes through in that period of separation and uh, and the loneliness actually and a little bit of that is not my autobiography as much I think as my my mother's um, biography because she's many many years later kind of confessed to me what it was like you know when I left when I flew the nest um, of course, at the time, I didn't give any a second for her feelings. I just went off to have a great time on my travels. Um, and only more recently, she said, you know, it's, it's a, it was a devastating moment when you went away. So a little bit of... And she was effectively a single mother. So it's sort of me and her and my son and, and then a lot of imagination thrown into the story. It's a huge, big event in your life when your youngest child leaves to go to university which he now has done um, it's almost as big as when they're born I mean that's a very big change when they arrive in the world but you sort of have a little bit slightly slower build up to that um, and that's always surrounded with positivity you know the birth of a child whereas the departure of a child to university it really is the beginning of their adult life it's not you know their 18th birthday or when they're 16 you know it is when they leave because their focus totally shifts away from the place where they've grown up quite rightly so and the parent should never hold a child back from that but it, it's it's a very profound shift um, you know I'm I'm fortunate because I you know I have other things to occupy my mind but I know many people, many mothers particularly, uh, for whom it's a period of you know, real desolation. You know, they shouldn't burden their children with this kind of knowledge, but actually, if they have spent the last 18, 19, 19 years focused entirely on their children, you know, it's like going off the edge of a cliff for them. You're quite damning with uh, uh, the other mother. Oh, the other mother, yes, is another, <laughs> the mother of the, the friend um, with whom the, the sort of main boy goes off travelling. Um, she's, she's a sort of extreme case of somebody who regrets not having spent more time with her child. So she's very emotional, completely un Kind of irrational about what's happening um, and full of guilt I think I mean I'm not I don't really feel her so much but I, there are women like that who then sort of exaggerate what it means to them that their child is going away because perhaps they have a moment of realization that that whole almost two decades has gone and they've spent it in the office and those are the women I almost feel much sorrier for than the women who spent 18 years perhaps nurturing their children more closely. So she's, uh, she's a lawyer who's basically 
gone back to work. I mean, I don't write this in the story, but one can assume it. She's gone back to work when the child is about maybe two or three weeks old, full-time nanny, probably a night nanny. Such people exist. And, um, you know, she's occasionally appeared at weekends. You know, there are, I know women like that. I know women who work for law firms and they work, sometimes they work 36 hours on the trot. There's a bedroom in somewhere in their horrendous office building, you know, so that they can take a two hour sleep and they never get home. Um, I don't really feel sorry for them though, so I made her rather a sort of object of pity in a sort of sort of despising way rather than I feel sorry for her way. 2012, gosh, I've had a series of a very kind of good years in the last few years and so even though it's kind of there's always something inside the year that I'm feeling uh, I suppose nostalgic because I do I am quite that's my sort of predominant fairly regular predominating mood is a sort of sense of things moving moving by and too quickly um, so 2012 that had it as a background there was you know William being away and then coming back and then going away in a different sense to go to university. Um, funnily enough, what really marked, the, the, what makes me remember 2012 is that it was the hundred years since the city of Thessaloniki became part of Greece. Um, so my last novel was all about Thessaloniki. Uh, so I've spent quite a lot of time there, you know, involved in those kind of celebrations of this centenary. And in fact, only last week spoke at the sort of big day held by the Macedonian Society of Great Britain to commem you know, to celebrate again that hundred years. So, 2012 as a year, bizarrely, means it's a Greek, it's a very Greek uh, thing. 2012, um, so it had a particular meaning for them that you know their second city you know, had this hundred year anniversary. Um, and I've spent a lot of time in Greece, you know, that's become very much sort of part of my sort of pattern now, that I, I go there usually for a few days every month. Um, so there's been a lot of sadness to do with Greece, um, what's happening there and how, you know, many of my friends out there have had truly catastrophic years in terms of their sort of day-to-day -day life and what's happening to their country. So I think it will, I'll remember it as a Greek year, um, if anything, with, I don't know, mostly, I mean, I know the UK is, has its problems, but I tend to compare with what's happening in Greece and they're really, certainly within, in London, where I, you know, when I'm in England, I spend a lot of my time in London. There's no comparison. You know, London to me seems like this amazing um, centre of life and buzz and atmosphere and multiculturalism. You know, it's full of Greeks, London. And that to me is always a sort of a nice thing when I hear Greek voices in the street, but it also reminds me of why they're here. And they're in London joining what actually sometimes feels like a bit of a party compared with what's going on in some of the other European countries. So, yeah, been a good year for for me in many ways, but I'm aware that it's been a bad one for other people. I mean, I, I read a lot of short stories, you know, as well as writing them now. Um, and I enjoy the fact that I can read something in its entirety, you know, on the bus, on the underground, on a train. And I don't have to kind of slightly, if you're reading a really big chunky novel, I know I'm not the only one that has to slightly go back a couple of pages every time I pick it up just to find where I was. So that might be five minutes, by which time I might have used five of my ten minutes. So it's a sort of, it's relatively slower to read a novel and I do like having a completeness about reading a short story. 
because I, if I, if I ever have the opportunity with a novel, I will read the whole thing in a sitting. I always read Maggie O'Farrell, for example, in one sitting. I cannot see how you could do otherwise. And I'm about to read her new one, which I've just got improved. Um, and I'm not going to pick that up on a Monday evening at 10 o'clock. I'm going to pick it up on a Sunday morning. And I'm, you know, it'll probably, she'll, she's usually about five, six, seven hours, you know, really enjoying it. And that to me is the ideal way to read, but you don't always have that luxury. So a short story is, and again, you know, on a Kindle or on a, you know, one of these new tablets coming out, they're, they're perfect for that, really are. You know, they're sort of like the sound bites of the literary world, I think. As a writer, they are the most exciting form of, of writing because you can create something, not just very quickly, because generally, you know, I'm spending three years writing a novel and it, I could, I and mean, I usually spend a little bit longer, but, you know, one could write, physically, write a short story in a day. So they are, you know, real extremes. Um, I feel that you can create very heightened sense of emotion very quickly in a short story and and I think you can leave your reader sort of devastated if you if you want to if you want to go in that direction I don't feel the need to kind of sort of to pick them up at the end you can leave them feeling really quite desolate by what you've written you know if they respond to it if they're feeling what it is you're trying to get across that I wouldn't I wouldn't do that with a novel I don't want to make people unhappy when I write novels but but with a short story I think you, you, you're sort of freer to do really whatever you want to do because if the reader doesn't doesn't like it you haven't taken up too much of their time you know it's it's a very it's a short, sharp slap in the face, if you like, if you want to deal with it that way, or it's a cream cake. I mean, those are just metaphors off the top of my head, but I mean, they, it, it's, a quick, it's a quick thing. It's quicker to write, it's quicker to read, um, and you can experiment. Whereas with a novel, I don't think I'd ever write an experimental novel, whatever that is, because it's a huge investment of time. For everybody, and uh, with a short story, you can adopt different voices. You can, I think, you can just be more adventurous. I, I'm, I think I'm more adventurous with a short story, and I think I'm safer with a novel. It's, it's definitely passion. You can't be indifferent to red. You, you always notice red. Um, I think a little bit of Chairman Mao, oddly. You know, that's a sort of classic <laughs> little red book, isn't it? I'm sure it's not behind this, though, that everyone must read this book. Maybe it is, but it's sort of it's going to be in every home <laughs> in the country. But it did, it's, you know, the format, not so unlike it. Um, yes, it's, I mean, it's passion. It's, for some reason, it's a very seasonal colour. It's very much connected with Christmas and December. Um, and it's a very warm colour, definitely. It's heat, it's hot. And I, I suspect that everything in here might provoke a response. I don't think there'll be anything bland in there. And of course, unless it's been misspelled, <laughs> and it's meant to have an A in, I'm sure it will be well read.